It's September 9th, 2021. This is Rook. She is an Iranian-Australian singer who we finally have got on the show. She has captured the imagination and ears of Persians around the world with her blend of musical styles and genres. She borrows from classical Persian traditions, as well as Western jazz, pop, and Latin feels. And while she's only really released two main records, Tara Tiba is already an award winner and a major name in Persian music. She joins us from Perth, down under to discuss her journey, her passions, her mental health challenges, and her future. The great Tara Tiba coming up. This is Conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 143 of Rook. Hope you are keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam du son Aziz, Durud Bashama, Tara Tiba coming up. It seems like we've been saying for about a year <laughs> Tara Tiba is coming on the show. I almost it's, I'm almost sad to have her on the show because I don't know who I'll promote from now on. Coming up next week, Tara Tiba. It's like, you know, which is one on repeat for a year. Uh, so uh, we'll go to Australia for Tara. Uh, uh, I know that uh, Kian, you're a big fan of oh, her I'm music. I'm a huge fan. I remember the first time I discovered um, the Persian version of uh, Fly Me to the Moon. I forget what ah, it's called. Yes. You know, it just captivated me. I was like, wow, I didn't know this existed, wow. this genre of music. You but know what else she does? A Persian version of the Alanis song, uh, uh, Uninvited. Uninvited. You're uninvited. You know really? that song? Yeah, yeah. No so, way. so uh, which blew me away. It's on the Omid record. I was just like, I mean, of all the things I never expected to right. hear, an Alanis song <laughs> right. in Persian. You know, uh, Alanis Morissette, the um, Canadian alterno pop yeah. songstress, whatever. So, uh, it's, it's great. I, I'm, I've got to ask her about it at some point in the interview because I don't know how she landed on that song That's to do so that in random. Persian. But yeah, huh. uh, and the Omid record, of course. Did really well. It won these Australian Music Awards, and and uh, and, and Tara's had a, an interesting history. I mean, she came. I think she was an architect, uh, or became an architect in Iran. Went to Australia. She's been back and forth to Iran. She's had some um, health struggles uh, of in recent years, and she's actually been very open. Uh, I think. Um, bravely and proudly and I think it's great that she's talked very openly about her mental health challenges which we'll also get to in the interview so Tara Tiba coming up in just a bit from Perth Australia hello to you the fabulous Keon Hi, hello Captain Reza hello sir hello Groovy Shia Hi, now I'm very excited because uh, Savvy Roham <laughs> I don't know how this happened but Sa- ah. Savvy Roham is at the uh, at the console he's he's yeah, engineering the show today hello Savvy yeah. Hello to you. Uh, we are we are cross training here. You're cross training. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm learning from Shaya to master yeah. the oh, recording. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's like the three stooges in the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three men and a lot of facial hair. So th- it's an entire little booth of facial hair. They're That's all, all I see. Yeah. They all of kind hair. of merge into the I same mean, look. Savvy's right? Savvy's uh, Sibyl, the Savvy Roham uh, mustache. It, it just grows like a, a Fu Manchu. It keeps coming. <laughs> it gets lower and lower. It's going to start hitting the console soon. It's yeah. like a Harley Davidson. Yeah. like yeah. Fantastic <laughs> no. mustache. It takes a lot of uh, hard work. To now, Reza is the director of the show, Captain Reza, uh, believe it or not. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I don't you know. I don't, so. I don't, for a year and a half, he's been, I don't know what exactly believe what it means. It but, not. you know, he he edits the show. But, and uh, and Keon, of course, you, uh, you're... <laughs> <laughs> on air, you're. you're <laughs> <laughs> ah, Keanu, of course, it's you're always, here, and we love it's you. It's always the joke. <laughs> I, I come back and you got it. No, 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 Keon. I mean, yeah, you do a lot of the uh, producing with us, and you've got the, you know, the in charge of the letters, and you do like all that. Oh, it's all Persian to us. In charge of the letters. Now, Shia, 
I mean, the, we all love Shia. Who doesn't love Shia? Nobody. Shia. No one doesn't love Shia. No. Uh, but uh, except Parisa's uncle, Super P's what? uncle. What? Yeah. She told me that she doesn't like Shia. He, the guy, he doesn't like Shia. You're joking. No. No, stop it. I Super don't know why. P. Super Call her in. You'll Super see. P? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Shia was like, yeah, baby, yeah. Get over here. <laughs> Shia is suddenly becoming an aggressive I person. Yeah. I've never He's heard never, him yell yeah. like that. Uh, Super, Super P, can you put on, can you give Super P some headphones? Can you hear me, Super P? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You can you just speak. come to the microphone? Okay. Now, uh, you were telling me that um, your uncle doesn't like Shia. <laughs> I mean, Shia. Uh, Maybe Shayan. <laughs> yeah, people of the jury. We, we, we're just surprised because no one, we've never met anybody who doesn't like Shia. What? Uh, what, what? I don't know why. I, I told him he's a very nice guy, but he said, <laughs> he, he, said that he doesn't like Shia. Oh but but is it, is it, did he say anything specific about so Come right to the microphone, Super yeah. P. Yeah, did he say anything specific about what why he doesn't like Shia? No, he just said he doesn't like Shia. He just <laughs> oh <my laughs> God. I asked him now. why he didn't say anything. He just said I don't like him. Wow. <laughs> sorry. Wow. I mean, okay, thank you, Super P. Sorry yeah. to put you on the spot. <laughs> That's Parry Saw, the fabulous uh, Super P. Does a lot of translation work. Aww. Does subtitles. She does uh, does all kinds of things. Uh, and just uh, just three months ago, came from Mashhad, the great Super P. Now. Uh, uh, but uh, I love your uncle. Yeah, I, I gotta say, I, I mean, I, listen, I mean, all kinds of people hate uh, me. I mean, I, I, and and Captain Reza. I mean, you got no shortage of trolls on the internet. But Shia, you know, it was just a surprise because, yeah. That's like what is it? It's like hating a puppy. How can you? No one hates a puppy. No one does. You see a puppy, you see a baby. But anyway, I, if I were a Super P's uncle, I'd be I, maybe I'd be asking, well, what does Shia exactly do? <laughs> yeah, right. Or, or and now mean, I'm with with Savvy Roham at the at the controls. What does Shia do? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. We ruined Shia's day, maybe even year by saying. I what? don't know about that. I think it's exciting for Shia to finally it's have a, a detractor. A hater. <laughs> a see now Shia. you know what it feels like, buddy. It's new. It's You've new made it. Now. Yeah. Oh. First of all, uh, the one thing I'm excited about having Savvy Roham near the the uh, in the booth here is because we can finally talk football, huh. talk soccer. <laughs> I'm surrounded by people. I, I mean, Shai claims to watch football, but I don't. Does you he? know, no. he's playing. You know, I thought he he just looks like he does yoga. He's all listening day. to yeah. He's listening to <laughs> violin music, <laughs> listening to Japanese tea music or something. You know. And, um, so Savvy Roham, maybe I'll ask you first. Yeah. Team Mali this week, yeah. the Iranian national team. Yeah. Big big victory, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they should have won. It's easy. But do. they they won three nothing against three Iraq. Three nothing. Yeah. Which I think kind of puts them in a pretty good position to make the World Cup. It's again. almost done because uh, Iraq was the hardest in the group, and the others are like easy games. So it's isn't South Korea in the group though? Not in the same group. No. Oh, I no. thought so. No, no, no. Not in the same. Well, group. then, yeah, it is easy. It's the United Arab Emirates. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It should be a. Um, and the Canadian team also mm -hmm. won yeah, this week a big, big game also against El Salvador. Which, and the, uh, so the Canadian team actually looks like for the first time in a while, like wow. it might have a chance to. Later. All of my all of my nationalities are <laughs> <laughs> are possibly getting into the World Cup. Uh, well, the English team tied uh, uh, against Poland, uh, but uh, wait a minute. So the theory we were like twirling around a little right. while ago that what if like Iran and Canada get into the the, uh, uh, and the World Cup? It's so exciting! A pos yeah, I know. Imagine wow. they play each other. Yeah. Yeah, what will I do? I'll have to tear myself crazy. apart. How, yeah. What oh happens in Toronto? For sure, there'll oh, yeah. be more Iranians there. Oh, I heard awesome. even the other day at the uh, at the Canada El Salvador game, there was a lot of El Salvadorian fans yeah. in the in the crowd. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow. but I don't know. I'll have to paint my face half yeah half, half maple leaf, <laughs> half Iranian I colors, would do half God. and half as well. Yeah. What, what, what would you? What would you do? I do half and half. Baba, toke a Paris Rusa shirazo madi. <laughs> but but yeah. umadam umadi yeah. oh. as shun umadi bodi things I never want to hear again. Reza singing, please. I'll pay you anything you ask. God, listen, it's been a long day. listen, uh, Reza. No matter what you're driving, you're not driving what Keon's boyfriend is driving. That's oh all, boy, that's all I gotta say. I, I had a feeling this would come up. Well, you don't have to post these things. <laughs> no, you know why? You don't I did? have to. So so I, to, let's just catch people up. I yeah. have a lot of uh, friends that are car enthusiasts and I was just uh -huh. highlighting the fact 
that it's a toy. Cars mm. are literally, bo- I was saying how yeah, yeah. boys don't grow up. They just buy more expensive toys. That's what cars yeah. are to not, me. I, I mean, not some some of us. I know this majority. probably cancels me out for most of the <laughs> Iranian right. community, yeah. but I don't care that. that much about fancy cars. But but your, your, your um, paramour. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's, I, I mean, I don't even, it's so out of my league, I don't even know what it is. I, <laughs> it looked like some spaceship to me. You know, it's uh, some, he bought some fancy number. car. It's, it's one of the new McLaren oh. 6. S1 I don't or even, F1 to or be whatever. honest, I don't even know. I don't know mm. anything about cars. But to me, it's such a waste of money. Literally, right. it could right. buy a house. Right. No, but here we are with this. I could buy a few houses, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Shia, would you like one of those uh, uh, M- McLarens? The new, uh, what is it? The, uh, I don't know, like <laughs> six is something. It, something. Uh, is is it a car, my my Florida? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a race car. I Did you not see her post? Uh, I saw what I, yeah. It was I like a humble brag. It was like, oh, I didn't, this is <laughs> it not, it's not mine. <laughs> These boys and their toys. Meantime, it's like a beautifully shot picture <laughs> yeah. of this car and like yeah. that she's in the car. It's a nice no, car, but I mean. I love the distraction. She's like before and after, before her hair is done, is all like up to <laughs> or whatever she's done. I don't know. Because I, I really, it was a surprise. Like yeah. he just like showed up to my house with this goddamn car and i was like what is this you so my hair it. that day was completely destroyed listen yeah. i need to invest in some scars you could uh, <laughs> with that with that car never did could, i think i would wear a russetti again but here we are go on sorry you could fund uh, our wardrobes <laughs> for Rook for the for the rest of our lives. I think Shia's uh, you get Savi Moham, get Savi Moha, uh, Savi Roham, a, a razor. You could yeah. get uh, get us uh, you all get, a razor. You get, you get everybody a razor. Get Reza some hair relaxer. Uh, get uh, I'll let him Shia, know. Shia Juna. Uh, I can send a gift to Paris's uncle. Oh, yes. uh, that's right. <laughs> to that's make right. him love you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, so what That's do you sad. what do you guys do in that car? You drive you around just town. Just drive literally now. Every time he's like, "Oh, we're out of milk. I need to go drive." <laughs> <laughs> oh Any excuse it's to such drive. An it. impractical Listen, car. It adds it's joy such an irony it. thing. That I'm not to take. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're someone, I your guys have got lovely guy, yeah. but it's such an irony thing that, that you is. know you go to those mahmunis and everybody yeah, has yeah, their yeah. car parked yeah. at front. And yeah. I've, I, I, my, I have my unwashed mini. You know, and I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. oh. No. Uh, Funny enough, like I like I've lived here for 16 years, but like I wasn't involved in the Persian community as much, or wasn't invited to any of these parties <laughs> for uh, to, to, uh, rather or but any uh, parties to or any yeah. parties. <laughs> 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 but uh, like quite recently, I've been I've been getting invited to a few of these, and it's just like the, it's mind-boggling, like the amount of pause. How do you mm. say pose in English? I like will bragging. Say, yeah. bragging. I will, I will give him about, yeah. I will give him some credit. He is not that. He he gen, genuinely yeah. loves cars. And yeah, he doesn't yeah, even yeah, he right. doesn't use Instagram or right. any of that. So it's, it's not coming about from that. an honest genuine place that he bought a <laughs> yeah. $500,000 car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> he loves cars. Now, Savvy yeah. Roham, you you can just jump in. I see you putting up your hand. You don't have to you go no, ahead. No, go no, ahead. it's just it's my gesture of my hand that uh-huh. is like that. <laughs> Did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I I want to say with that car you need to be the last to come to the party so everyone can see that uh, yeah. Ah. Yeah, that's true it's just a tip I'll, just, I'll pass wait a second if you're the last to come to the party isn't everybody already in the party yeah but they see you coming with that car I see because the car uh, is loud they're all looking out the window yeah right <laughs> It is loud. Loud. Jeez, there's yeah, so much. Loud. This is so detailed. What you have to do with these fancy cars, it's, uh, <laughs> and you have to have the key in your hand when you come in. So okay, yeah. you sound like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> well, I saw people with uh, that car. Oh god. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, if the day he starts doing that, like taking out the keys <laughs> and driving the no, that's that's when the relationship's uh, over. That's where you draw <laughs> the line, eh, Keon? <laughs> Thankfully, I love it's not that way. I love that Keon's got some ethics about yeah. this. <laughs> you know? She's like, leave the bragging to me, yeah. okay? I know how to do it subtly. <laughs> it's like, I stop wearing certain brands because Persian men have ruined that's it. That's why <laughs> I love uh, Teslas, because they don't have a key. Uh, so you don't oh, have to show up. I didn't know I that. See. Yeah. Savvy Roham knows a lot about cars. Who knew? He does. He's a savvy, savvy guy. He knows about football. He knows about uh, cars. 
Persian Mehmuni. We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, and CastBox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, you can switch over to YouTube where we do visuals. Uh, and if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and Farsi, check us out on Telegram. In the coming days on Rook, Roya Hakakian, uh, the writer, the journalist, uh, uh, Arash Sobhani from the group uh, Kiosk, and he has got a, a new album out that's like a album slash film, really interesting project. Tina Talebi, you know who that is? Yes, Tina and James. Tina on and Instagram. James. Yeah. yeah, they're very you, funny. You're fans of theirs. They oh, yeah. are very funny. Uh, they're Canadian uh, mm -hmm. and looking forward to having Tina on the show. Hamid Saidi. Uh, Shia, we, another person we've been promising for a long time. We're going to get him at some point. Uh, we, we, we booked him, but, you know. And so uh, from the uh, band um, Opium. Opium Moon, that's right, who have just released a, a couple of records this summer, and Hamid also released a record. Looking forward to having him, the great Santour player. And uh, we're launching our new series, The Contemporary History of Iran, in the coming days. Listen and look out for that on our platforms. A big shout out to Kati Kavandi and Kati Kavandi Immigration Services Incorporated. You can find them at kavandi.ca. So you, you might have heard the recent news in Iran regarding restricting some internet users. Apparently the word immigration, the word immigration is the most used word in Google searches in Iran and the immigration demands have skyrocketed in the in recent weeks. So you want to find the right immigration consultant. You don't want a consultant who might take advantage of this huge amount of applicants for beneficial purposes by giving misleading information. If you're looking for an immigration consultant, search if they are official members of the ICCRC, look up their reviews. Kati Kavandi Immigration Services Incorporated is well known for working honestly with their clients, very responsive, handling and chaperoning successful applications all the way through the process. You can check their reviews on Google. Kati Kavandi Immigration Services, uh, find them on Instagram at kati.kavandi.immigration or the website kavandi.ca. Chai, I keep telling you, yes. you can get some help from Kathy Kavandi <laughs> yes. so you can stay in the country. I try my best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you can get a McLaren after a while. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the name McLaren. It's like, it's like a name of an author, you know, a poet. Mm. Like Henry K. McLaren. Wrote Don't look at me, Shai. I have no idea. <laughs> that, <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, actually, McLaren, I happen to know McLaren is a very famous, uh, uh, like a race car, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is a race yeah. car. Yeah. It is a British race Apparently car. Apparently, it's the fastest. That's yeah. that, uh, mm. according to... Faster your boyfriend, <laughs> according to your boyfriend. <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right. <laughs> I yeah. don't think it's faster than Gian. Uh, no. the, uh, you know <laughs> okay. what? I'm I am in the market to find. We may like I, if anybody ever has a Gian uh, in in Canada, like an old Gian car. You know, I will totally you know You'll do what I can to buy. Consider it. I would. Are Lion? you kidding me? Driving <laughs> wow. around Gian, driving around in a Gian. I mean, <laughs> which which for the inexperienced. I mean, I've never seen one of these cars in person. Yeah. You know, I've never. I've only seen pictures of it mm. i just and it looks like an old mm, shitty lotta <laughs> or something you know like uh, so i i think it'd just be the Very funniest weirdly. thing you know yeah. if i had uh my Gian, probably like it'd be broken down somewhere and it'd be like you know <laughs> Kian drives by with her like the fastest car the McLaren wow. just goes by and I'm in the Gian and there's smoke coming out of it you know. <laughs> a safety by. hazard are they uh, even legally drivable I don't, I don't I don't I don't know I'd have to figure out how to drive on the other side of the like the steering wheels on the right hand side oh. right no uh, no because no, the ones no. in Iran, it's it's on the. On oh, does Iran, Iran's on the same side? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, the drive is the same as here. Yeah. And does Iran? Do you drive on the same side of the street as here? Exactly. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So talking right. about cool. shit we don't know about. <laughs> Everybody's like giving their opinion. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get to our feature guest. Savvy Roham, thank you for joining us, and you'll be at the dials. You'll be handling this with the yes, music and sir. all that. Yeah. All right. Groovy Shy is behind him there, overseeing, making sure it's going to be okay. <laughs> We're going to get to Tara Tiba. Uh, I'll talk to you afterwards, uh, Keon. I know you're excited to hear her, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll see you as well, Captain Rosa. Please direct well. <laughs> My featured guest today is an acclaimed Iranian-Australian vocalist known for her distinctive sound that fuses traditional Persian singing with jazz, Latin contemporary, and experimental music. 
Take a listen to this. برگی سوی تریجان کم تر زنشانه چون نرچین و شکنش دارد دل من کاشانه چون نرچین و شکنش دارد دل من کاشانه بکشاز مویم گرهی چند ایمن تا بکشایی گرهی شاید زدل دیوانه تا بکشایی گرهی شاید زدل Yes, yes. The sounds of Tara Tiba and a little taste of the song Bint Al Shalabia from her fabulous 2019 record, Omid. Tara was born in Tehran. From an early age, she studied classical music. And then in her teenage years, took an interest in traditional Persian music, which led her to studying the singing style of Radif with prominent Iranian vocalist maestro Hengame Akhavon. Tara is one of the few singers of her generation who has mastered the Persian classical canonic repertoire, Radif. In 2012, Tara moved to Perth, which is in Western Australia. A year later, while studying jazz at the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts, she formed her own band and performed on stage for the first time. And in 2014, Tara released her debut album, A Persian Dream. Then in 2019, released her second record, Omid, for which she received brilliant reviews and an Australian recording industry nomination for Best World Album and a Western Australian Music Award for Song of the Year for her song, Bahar. Tara has performed at many prestigious venues around the world, including New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Met Gala, the National Auditorium of Music of Spain, and the BBVA Tivoli, Portugal. But right now, Tara Tiba joins me from Perth, Australia today. Hello. Hello, Gian. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to finally have you on the program. You know that we've wanted you to do this for about a year or more than a year. Oh, man. (laughs) It's not easy to book Tara Tiba, you know? it's You got to go through hoops. You got to talk to your people. You got to make sure that, you know, I mean, it's not easy. (laughs) Oh, man. Nah, it's it's, it's so lovely to be here talking to you. It's it's really cool. You know, you're often talked about, uh, and I did it in the intro there, as being unique. The word unique is used, uh, a specific kind of sound, an interesting sound, unique in the Persian music landscape. And that's obviously true, uh, and that's one of the great things for you. I mean, you've sort of got your own lane. But I was reflecting on that as I was coming to this interview and thinking about you and thinking, it's it's sort of a strange thing that that out of a country of... 80 million people or 90 million, 100 million people, if you include the diaspora, that there aren't more Tara Tibas. Does it surprise you that you're so unique in the landscape? Well, I cannot call myself unique. You know, it's just something, um, I don't know, the reviewers might have said, but, you know, why, why are you putting me on spot telling me that to tell that I'm so special? <laughs> I cannot do that. <laughs> No, but you can reflect on the fact that it's it's interesting that there haven't been more Persian artists emerging, doing the kind of music that you do. Ah, uh, okay. It's probably because I or some uh, some other artists like me, we had to do it the hard way, you know, because of the gap that there was, you know, after the revolution, um, there was a gap between the musicians um, of older generation, the actual ones who were performing, and uh, not the the ones who were teaching, and the you know the the music that was out. Um, there, there's a huge gap. And then when we started, you know, when we wanted to do something, we wanted to um, produce music and and be live performers. There was no one actually to um, to think, you know, as a role model. Sometimes 
so I think、um, that was really hard, but at the same time, probably that pushed me to have my own sound. Yeah. So, and the other thing is that okay, I come from a music background of Persian traditional, like the Radif、right. tradition、um, of of style of singing, also the music and the improvisational、um, tradition. Yes. And、um, so that's actually really heavy. So if you want to perform that. To people who are not from that tradition, and、um, they're not Iranians, it's just really, really, you know, heavy for them. They might come to your gig once because it's really cool, you know, to see something new, and、uh, it's like、uh, going to a museum, and and that's it. Next time, why would they come and see you? Do you mean heavy, like dense, or heavy, sad, or heavy, difficult to understand? What What do you mean by heavy? <laughs> exactly the third one. For for someone for for let's say an Australian who is just it's it's so bizarre, you know, and just they have never heard of it because you know we are so Iran's music like other things of Iran, we've been just so isolated for such a long time, and、um, so this sound is so so far to the ears of a Western ear or. Even like you know, people have heard Indian singing and、um, Arabic singing, but the you know traditional Persian singing is just so far to the ears. What I had to do was I had to kind of make it understandable、mm. for more people. So I thought that okay, I just need to give this in a in a package. You know? So you chose experimental jazz. <laughs> 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 How can I make this easier for people? I'll I'll do Radif singing over experimental jazz,、um, but <laughs> but but actually there is a real. I mean, obviously there's the Latin connection in your music, and and you've worked with on this most recent record,、uh, Grammy Award nominee、uh, pianist and composer Ivan Mellon Lewis. Uh, and develop this Cuban Iranian sound, which is so rich and fascinating. You've said you feel a connection with Cubans that they are somewhat like Iranians. How so? Oh yeah, it's very interesting. You would never think that way that、um, Cubans Iranians. Why would they be very similar? Yeah, we always know. Okay, through Spanish, and you know, so we are a bit like close. Latinos are close to us, but. Particularly Cubans, because my ex partner he's Cuban, and it was so funny that we never felt any cultural differences that like made it uncomfortable. And the thing is that it's very interesting growing up in、uh, post-revolution countries. Very similar, very very similar experience. Right, the sense of isolation as a country, the economic disparity that comes with that. I, I I've never thought about that. That that's true. That would that would lead to common experiences, say for kids growing up. Yeah, absolutely. I think the isolation from the rest of the world is one big thing, and of course we have that you know hot blooded vibe that we have. So that actually makes it really oh yeah, it's so cool. It's it's very different from. If I'm just,、um, you know, my relationship with the、uh, Aussie guys, it's very different from, you know, someone from Cuba. But you know, I mean, obviously, there's the the top level. There's some, someone like Gugush who was has flirted with kind of flamenco music in in her sounds, especially in the later years. But、um, it's very interesting to me as somebody who who's born there in the '80s and grew up in Iran in the '80s and '90s. I mean, were you exposed to Latin music? I mean, where where would you even have found, say, Cuban music, or is this something that you came to later in life? We Iranians we connect to Latin music because of the harmony in in Latin music, flamenco and Latin music. It's it's very close. It works with um with our ear and the the modes that we have. Um, so, like you know, Esfahan, Homayun, and、um, Dashti, these、uh, modes in the Persian music, the, the harmony that works with these ones.、Um, actually, you can find it in, in in flamenco, and you can find it in Latin music. <laughs> شکسته شیشه ی قلبم مزین دریا ی خون چشم زده آتش به آلم اگه نیستی چرا از توی 
سینم صدای قلب تو میکوبه هر شب اگه نیستی چرا حرفا میپیچی تو گلوی من به جا میخونی آبا So I think that's the harmony that takes us to, um, you know, we feel connected to flamenco, we feel connected to Latin music, we feel connected to fado. And so, yeah, I think that's why. Can you sing an example of that? What do you mean by the, when you say harmony? What does that mean, the, the common harmony? The harmony, the chord progressions that it's sweet to our ear. Mm-hmm. I think that works well w- to to our ears, you know, than like listening to a, um, a classic rock song uh-huh. um, with uh-huh. the, you know, four chord harmony that's happening there. It's just so understandable for everyone in the world, but we Iranians might not connect to it as much. I got you. But we would like connect to a, a you know, a song that is like uh, with Andalusian cadence. You know, like it always just would just put the endless in cadence yes, and just yes. all, all remains, love it. It makes a lot of sense that there's a lot more uh, commonality musically with Fado, as you say, the Portuguese kind of uh, sound than, than Led Zeppelin. Uh, that, it's, it's true. I, I, I hear what, But do you remember when you first heard the kind of Latin music, Latin jazz, contemporary Latin music that, that would lead you to the kind of sound that you have now? Um... Not really. It was not like one particular moment I said, oh, this is so cool. I want to do this because you know how things, you know, it just develops over time. One thing that led me to experiment with jazz, like the Iranian traditional music is is based on improvisation. So I said like, well, okay, I just bring mine and I collaborate with you guys. Right, so right. Um, It's really interesting to me, um, Iranian classical music, the, the notion of improvisation, because it seems so antithetical to the stereotype I have about classical music, which would be very regimented. You know, you play what Beethoven wrote for you to play. <laughs> you, don't, you don't mess around. You don't fuck around. You don't improv. Uh, it's so interesting that there's, that improvisation is is embedded in, is laced into classical sonati Persian music, huh? Mm, yes, absolutely. I think um, I'm not an expert in, in Western classical music, but in times of, I think, Baroque music, Bach and um, those uh, composers, I think there were some elements of uh, improvisation happening there. So there was just some space for improvisation. Um, so I think after like years, it became more rigid mm-hmm. but um i think that's what has happened but but we still have that improvisation tradition in persian classical music or traditional music <laughs> I think what is happening in these in the past few years is because um, I think the jazz festivals and the jazz scene, I think they just wanted to spice it up. So I think they started collaborating with artists of world music, sure, which sure. I hate yeah. the world. Yeah. So they're just bringing the other traditions to jazz. I think that's one of the things probably that I chose to. It's like, okay, this is something it seems that it can work. And then for the second album that I, I it just happened to be all Cubans. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that um, record, Omid, and and the amazing sounds that you've made on that record. Um, and, and just a, a point about jazz, as now that you're bringing it up, it, it is, it's true that the definition of jazz certainly has become more and more elastic. And I think it's a good argument can be made that the most interesting, adventurous, experimental music to be found, if you want to go see it somewhere, would probably be at a jazz, would be the Montreal Jazz Festival. That um, because it, it's become inclusive of all these international sounds and this these different kinds of music. And, uh, and it's so interesting that that dovetails with Persian classical music. Because again, 
classical music. I mean, I, I remember, I think I, I might have even told this story on, on Rook before, but I remember when I was a, a teenager in my first sort of rock band and there was a kid at school, one of our friends who was a really, really great classical clarinet player. Like he was, he had already been scouted by the Philadelphia Symphony and he was, you know, he was a superstar. And um, one day we said, hey, let's jam. You know, he came to our rehearsal space. And this is this monster clarinet player. And we started playing. We said, okay, well, you solo now. And he was like, what? I don't know how to do that. Get Write something <laughs> down know. for me and I'll play it, you know. And that was my schooling in terms of, oh, this is the classical lane and this is the sort of improvisational jamming jazz, you know, rock lane or whatever. Uh, so the fact that that there is this synergy between Persian classical music and free jazz is really cool. You know? It is actually really cool. Um, but it has its limitation, I'm telling you, because we have the quarter tones. In, in Persian classical music. So it actually make it really, really, really difficult to work with you know, the harmonies, the, the, the chords, and uh, because it just clashes, you know, the, it doesn't sound good uh, when it just gets to the, you know, quarter tones. But when I'm doing maybe solo improvisation or duo improvisation with a ney or camancha, then I can just go crazy traditional with all the quarter tones and, you know, crazy up, up and down and up and down. And yeah, so. Uh, you know, I was asking you about uh, growing up and, and your exposure to Latin music. Let's go back to your, your early years in Iran. And, you know, you're such a, you're a strong voice. I mean, not just your singing voice, but you're you're an independent voice, a strong female voice, and you've attributed that to your childhood. Tell me about coming from a line of strong women in Tehran. Hmm, interesting. I never thought that you're going to ask that question. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, if if I want to talk about my mom, my mom is. Oh my God, <laughs> she's such a strong character. And, um, you know, you, you just don't compare me with her. <laughs> she is something else. Um, she's in fact a doctor. She, she's from a small town and um, not from a fancy family or anything. I think it was just, it was really impressive, I think, that she just went to uni and then just became a doctor. And um, I think she, that's been a, she has been a role model. It's not like you don't look up to your mom as like, oh, you, she, you're my role model. You're always fighting with her. But I think that she has been my role model. Also my dad, which is the more emotional. He is the soft one. He's the funny one. What I am is combination of both. I think when I'm just, I get the crazy part from my dad and just not the serious one, just making jokes and stuff. And and then I have this face of like, oh, it's just so elegant and, you know, so sophisticated and all of that. I think that I get that from my mom. So I have like these two <laughs> like extremes in me. What, what does your dad do? Oh, he's an engineer. And they're in, in Tehran still? Yes. So you're you're the product of a doctor and an engineer. Yeah, but he could be an artist. <laughs> oh, oh, he you know, could be. Well, because it's interesting because, I mean, you're so artistic, you know, in terms of everything that I know of you. Um, but you actually went and became an architect in Iran. Not a doctor or an engineer, but, you know, uh, up on the list of what we're supposed to be as Iranians, an architect. Tell me about that decision before you end up going oh, into music. Man. Okay, I tell you about the schools and you would be really happy not that you didn't go to school in Iran. Um, so, um, so since you get to middle school, like you're around 12, you are stressing out about the concours. I don't know if you have heard about that. It's the entrance exam for universities. Right, so yes. It's not like other places that you apply for unis and they accept you or some. No, we have just this one one day exam that like all the country are sitting that yeah, exam and then yeah. if you just mess it up that's you're completely how polite i can be <laughs> you don't have to be polite you don't have to be polite go ahead yeah, yeah so this is like the stress that we go through but so many people are like me i think we have this maths and physics um the um the science that you, you can go to become a doctor biology after that. or something yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the um, literature and then the arts. So, 
like forget about the literature and the arts i mean if you can do the maths and physics it's really hard that people like parents would let you do go do literature and arts i had to go oh my god it's not even the normal ones i had to go through this gifted talented whatever schools and um and then it's even more difficult there than the normal ones and then you're just stressing out all the time and um, i think i was waiting for this to talk about you just asked me one question it's really coming out on and on about this 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 is a reality we need to talk about for real because i want to tell you that becoming an artist there in iran it's not just that oh you're a female singer you, you, you cannot sing you are this and that you cannot sing you it's a, it's that huge obstacle is there mm. because all you're stressing about is passing that exam all your teenage time so mm. you go to school and the after that you're studying till like late night and just imagine how you can study music as well because we don't we don't study music at school so i remember when i was playing piano i was just um i would wake up four o'clock in the morning and um and and practice piano four o'clock in the morning as like a teenager so and then stress about that as well so it's it's all stressful all the time and um so okay fast forward which i did not fast forward but my only chance of getting to art school like art university was doing architecture through the maths and physics. Oh, wow. Like, so you picked architecture as a way of getting into the arts. Exactly. Wow. That's so interesting. <laughs> Did you become a practicing architect at all, or, or was it just getting the degree? I really worked hard during, during the years that I was studying there, but then I realized this is just not personal enough for me. Yeah. I think this just it, it involves a lot of things that it, when it's too far from you know being artistically creative you've got to do if you're lucky you might be able to you know become an architect who can just do her own designs and stuff so i was like well no i'm not going to go with that <laughs> گدار دومی مخمل به پوشون گدار سومی دی 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 داره یاره گل زر دو همه در دو تو بیا تا دور تو گرد و تو بیا تا دور تو گرد و ما یاره جانه یاره جانی دوباره تر نمیگرده دیگر جوانی And besides that I always wanted to do music you know I always wanted to um, the music so it's just it's always been like going different paths just it's like a what is that these video games that you're just going the obstacles and then just trying to find your it way it really is crazy it really is the opposite of the west where there's so much care put into or their attempts at care put into not putting too much pressure on the uh uh, educational system you know like uh on kids uh and and so this idea that there's this national test that everybody has to do and you stress about what number you get and uh it's it, it is quite different i mean it's very different from growing up in in england and canada as i did so, so you at the same time you do start studying classical piano and then singing radif and and this um as i mentioned in the introduction you study privately under maestro Hengame uh, what can you tell us about that? What, what, I mean, what did you most learn from her? I studied classical piano when I was eight. So during my primary school, it's so interesting because if you're doing classical music in Iran at that time, it was like either you're doing Western classical music or you're doing the tra- traditional Persian music. They were just two completely different worlds. And um, so I was not interested at all in the you know, Iranian music. And then I just got fascinated. All of a sudden I was 16 and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I want, I fell in love with the vocal technique. In fact, it's like, whoa, this is crazy. I would never, ever, ever be able to do that. And I just wanted to just give it a go. Yeah. So I went to hang on my I was really, really lucky that um, she was teaching in that time. And, and the, the, the teaching method was so traditional. It's like, okay, this is the Askoi Shur. So it's like, 
whoa, okay, that's it. <laughs> just record it and just go and sing it. That's that's that was it. And it was, I remember like every day I was just trying. It was so funny how I was trying, but I managed. <laughs> Were you inspired by her? I mean, I know that she had or she has her own sort of sad story of having her career basically curtailed when she was in her prime by the revolution, which means she couldn't play concerts or record music or for many years. How did, how did her story affect you? Oh, well, her story is not just her story. I think it was just the story of all the female singers. You know, I grew up knowing that that fact. It's interesting that when you want to learn, you just don't think about, oh, yeah, I want to become a professional singer you know you just you start you know learning because you love it and then you think oh i want to do this as as a profession oh yeah i cannot do it here yeah but i think i feel so lucky that i could learn from her because i got to the root of the you know the tradition i learned from her that she was one of the sources um yeah you end up recording if i have this correct I mean, I, I heard this in one place. I'm not sure if it's even true, but you recorded an EP in Iran in 2010. Um, but of course, you couldn't release it in Iran. What, what did it sound like? Yeah, it was like a duo uh, of piano and voice. And it sounded good, actually. It was like good pianist playing with me. So it was improvised based. Why not release it? Why not uh, put it out as this is my you know early years when I was in Iran kind of thing? Uh, probably perfectionism, which is a illness. <laughs> <laughs> right. You probably you probably you mean you hate it. If you listen to it, you feels you hear mistakes. I know. And- I hate. It's so funny. I just hate everything that is like I've done in the past. I was like, <laughs> oh shit! I had to do it this way. I had to do it that. Way. Oh no! I just don't. Want, you know, I don't want to listen to it because I, all I hear is like, oh, the things are the mistakes and like the things I could do better. You know, I, I always, um, I always ask this question, but um, it's it's actually probably my favorite question. How long does it take before you hate something you've done? In other words, do you already hate the Omid album because it's two years old now, or? <laughs> Is it because I have a little bit more time before you hate it? Oh my god, it's it's interesting. No, I don't hate it at all okay. because I didn't get to listen to it that much, and I didn't get to perform it that much. Oh, that's right, because it, it, you you put it out and then COVID happened, so you couldn't tour it as much, and and so it yes. still feels a little fresh, yes, right? But um, even before that, because I got sick. Right. Right. <laughs> But you know, uh, we'll, and we'll get to that. But I, I still think there's hope. If you, uh, if you go listen to it, you might hate it now. So we uh, let's not give up on hating it. There's still a chance to hate your brilliant record. Why are you uh, doing that to me, Sean? <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, I, I'm allowed to love it. I'm not you. Uh, so, so tell me about this. Obviously, this is a a defining moment in your life. Is the decision to leave Iran? I guess you were around. 28 years old uh to move to australia in uh 2012 uh to follow your passions presumably as an as an artist tell me about that decision and and what and how difficult it was to make well immigration is not an easy thing at all it's a huge thing when you do it i mean you are driven by so many things that you just like you have so many dreams and you want to achieve things and then you'd really try hard and it's like yeah okay i'm just gonna get out of this place i'm gonna do this and that and do this and that and now after almost 10 years i was like whoa where am i what happened to my life Immigration is so hard. Just you don't understand it until you understand it. But tell, well, let's take it step by step. So tell me about the moment where Tara Tiba goes, I got to get out of Iran. 
What was the mm-hmm. what what was that moment? And what was the conversation say you were having with your family or with yourself for that matter? Unfortunately, that's a conversation that that you go through so many times. You know, you always think that if you want to achieve something, you you got to get out, and which is so sad. You either stay and you cannot achieve what you wanted to do or just leave and, you know, just go somewhere else that has nothing to do with your life in the past. Yeah. So it's it's a sad thing. I'm, I always talk about this. It's just uh, no one, no one immigrates by choice. You know, why would you want to be displaced? <laughs> I mean, it's cool to go and learn things. You know, it's really, immigration's got lots and lots of good things at the same time, I would say. So what happened in 2012 after years of this conversation being a conversation that you have that led you to leave and go to, of all places, Perth, Australia? <laughs> yeah, that's a funny choice, isn't it? <laughs> um, Australia's got this program, Skilled Migrant. Of course, artists are not included in that. As an architect, I could apply for it, and uh, it would take me two years to get the visa. And um, so that, that that was it. That was how I got that, So architecture came in handy. <laughs> I know. Uh, that's a that's what I want, want to say. Like, we always study all those things. <laughs> Just to get out. Wow. That's it. It's so crazy. It's so funny, isn't it? It's so crazy. It's like a, you have to add 10 years to anything that a kid growing up in the West would do because you've got all these mokafat, all these things that you have to do to, to be able to just get, get your career started. It's like hafran rostam, if you know about that. Yes, yes. And the funny thing is that then you compare yourself with someone who didn't have to go through all of that. You know, it's like, oh, why didn't I achieve this and that? It's like, dude, you know how you had to go through all of this? Can you even just, it's so hard to comprehend that like you had to go through all of this and we're not even talking about, we're just talking about a little tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. So not that being an artist or a musician is a is necessarily a competition or a race, you know, but but it it really is like if you're Iranian and particularly if you grew up in Iran, Iranian and you know, it's like in the Olympics where somebody starts uh, 10 feet ahead of the next person when they're running in the oval, you know, it's like somebody growing up in the West is is just has a head start that you don't have because Absolutely. you have to go become an architect to get out of the country. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> so once you're in Australia, you, uh, I, I'm, I guess things start to flourish because within a couple of years, you release your debut album, which is, of course, A Persian Dream, and that's in the year 2014. It comes out with a splash and really puts you on the map, I think, for the Persian community around the world. I want to play a piece from that album. Take a listen to this. لاله ها بیدارن تو کوها دارن گل 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 آفتاب و میکارن تو کوها دارن گل 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 آفتاب و میکارن There you go, the sound of Tara Tiba a little taste of the song Saru Madzem Estun, Winter is Over that was on her debut album that came out in 2014, A Persian Dream. Uh, that becomes a pretty big song for you. Did you have a sense that it was going to become a, a song that would get uh, heard by people around the world? Well, I was not planning to record that song at all. But what happened was when I was doing the live concerts, I think I started playing this song as an encore. So it just I knew that people know it. And they just loved it so much <laughs> that I thought, well, okay, I just, I just got to record this. And the thing is that this song, again, is, it's, it's about hope for me. And, um, you know, the, whatever, like, you know, if you want to talk about political, I, I don't really care. I think it's, it's about hope. You can just see it as uh, in a political way or you can see it in a, you know, non-political way. Um, I think it's just, it's about hope and, and, and hope is so important. I think that's, we live with hope. 
you're fond of that word because it becomes the name of your next record. But that that yeah. song, if I understand it, that was a big song during the Green Movement, right? That was a song that people sang in the streets. Um. Well, if it, it just goes back before that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was not particularly recording that because of the Green Movement or anything. Yeah, um, your intentions were not political. It was just to kind Well, of I cannot be political. I don't want to be pol political because because I want to be able to work as an artist. <laughs> I think just doing your work as an artist, it's already fighting. Um, so, yeah, you don't want to get involved in something that it's not your area probably but it's this is very controversial i think um you know subject people are going to start hating me but what, what, <laughs> but that, well, well that's interesting i mean what if you're a political person then and you're an artist then you you choose to be a political artist right if you're not you're not it doesn't that yeah make... but but if you're a french you know or if you're a canadian because the price that you pay is right. not is not high at all you know, you can be, oh, yeah, I'm political. I'm just talking about this and that. And, yeah, I'm so cool and I want to make change. But, you know, the price of being political as an Iranian is so high right. that you can just not be able to do anything at all. Yeah. So what's the point? You know, I understand the people who do it and it's just, you know, uh, appreciated and all of that. But... um I think about it if I cannot, you know, already just had to fight so much just to be able to sing. This is something that's come up a few times. I, I think, for example, with Paris Tanavali, where the, the great yeah. artist, uh, where people have said to him uh, at times, why aren't you more political? <laughs> you know, uh, And the argument is something like, because of the situation of Iran, uh, uh, that artists have a responsibility to be political. You know, And we've had that debate on this show. Does Paris Tanavoli have a responsibility to be political? Is he somehow being derelict? You know, why, as you say, if Paris Tanavoli was a, was a Canadian sculptor, nobody would say, you need to be political. Um, some people might prefer him to be, but, you know, uh, so how do you grapple with that question of the responsibility that you have as an artist somehow? I think the responsibility, this is very clear to me, is, is to work you got to keep working well so i'm not talking about that oh i could stay and 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 do this and that and like you know just do um what is that zado band bokoni bo desario you know show you come on like you deal under table with some uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah i don't like that sort of a thing well even even if i was not a female singer that i could not sing at all in iran I would probably not be able to work as an artist still there because I wouldn't like to do those kind of things. Right. So I think that's maintaining your integrity um, because you can be a political artist just for the sake of having more fans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think I think it's just it's the most important thing is that just to maintain your integrity, whatever you're doing. But Tara, you do pick your spots because you've spoken out. I mean, you were involved in this amazing project uh, uh, three years ago called Siren Song, which I want to ask you about in, in Perth and where your voice was projected uh, uh, across the city of Perth for hours and hours and, uh, you know, and across all these speakers and buildings. And you have to tell us about that. But but you said at, the, at that time, um, this was important to you uh, as an immigrant, as an Iranian in Perth, in Australia, because your voice, you said, my voice is a voice of all the women in Iran who cannot be heard, um, which is a beautiful statement. But I, I think people would consider that a political statement. Um, so there's there's places that you do go that you want to, uh, things that you do want to s assert or say, right? 
Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, I'm singing now, you know, just uh, somewhere down under in Perth, in Western Australia, which is the most isolated <laughs> capital city in the whole world. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing this. If we go back to the siren song, it was such strange feeling and amazing feeling at the same time, because I felt that, oh my God, in Tehran, like my neighbor hadn't heard my singing. They would not even know I'm a singer. And now look at this, hmm. all these skyscrapers, like all these ah, speakers. It was amazing, such an amazing project. And with this, the, you know what the crazy thing was? The, the, the chopper, the helicopter, it was going around and I was in the middle of this main street and it was coming from the above, my voice. So I was like, what? And I just started crying and crying and crying. So it's like, oh, it's just unbelievable, unbelievable that, um, you know, your voice is not being heard there. And then here it's just coming from the above. It's being projected <laughs> like a siren around the city. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me ask you about the Omid album. Uh, this is your most recent record, the one that came out in 2019, because it really is all joking aside about h hating when you're going to hate the record or whatever. It, it's quite spectacular. I've loved this record. And, and, it, and at the centerpiece of this album, which we've talked about, it was um, uh, you worked on this with uh, Yvonne Mellon Lewis. This is the, uh, the Cuban uh, Grammy Award nominee. Uh, and you used some of the finest Cuban and Iranian musicians on this album. But the centerpiece is the song Omid, which of course means hope. Uh, I want to play a little bit of that song. Actually, let's play a bit of it and then you can tell me a bit about where that song comes from in you. <laughs> از باغ تو جیدم از فرشته از پری رمز لبت را می شنیدم می کشیدم من غمت را و لبت را می چشیدم There you go. Just a little taste of the title track of the album Omid by Tara Tiba. That's the song Omid, and I encourage everybody out there to go find that song and listen to the whole thing because we don't do it justice by just playing a few seconds of it. But um, what can you tell us about that song? It is just so gorgeous. It is a beautiful piece of work. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, I wrote that song some years ago. Well, that's my original, and I talked about it with, with Malone, and uh, he did this beautiful arrangement and um, and beautiful lyrics. Mahyarta must be my friend. He just wrote amazing, beautiful um, lyrics on it. And um, yeah, that's it. I think that's that was. Did you write it on piano, uh, Tara? I write it on piano, but um, just the voice. I record the voice and the you know a bit of chords and the vibe and stuff. Um, it's gorgeous. So. It's gorgeous. So this album ends up getting you nominated uh, and winning awards for this record in Australia. And I, I was thinking about that. I was thinking, I mean, it's always nice to win awards, but it must have felt, especially as someone who um, came to Australia less than a decade ago, there's certainly a feeling of being embraced by a country when you win awards there as an Australian. Uh, tell me what it meant to you. ARIA Awards is huge here in Australia. It's like Australia's Grammys. Yes. So that was when I, you know, when I got the email that I got nominated, I was like, whoa, couldn't believe it. It's really, really huge. And you feel that, okay, this country has just gave me the opportunities, you know? We, of course, Iran has gave me the opportunity with the, um, the tradition. I think I, if I didn't have that, I don't think I had much to to offer so i think um at the same time iran and australia they have given me the, this opportunity to become the artist that i am right now um so yeah it felt amazing do you think australians see you as australian or as iranian or iranian australian hmm i actually don't know because you sing because, in persian right 
Yes, yes, I do sing in Persian. The thing is that my music is not mainstream, so it's not being played on the mainstream radios. They, if if they play my music, it would be like in a you know, more artistic programs or like jazz programs on radio. So it's got this very um, particular audience um, that I think they're very cultured, but. Um, yeah, I feel I don't feel excluded. It's a it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I think I don't feel excluded as an artist. Yes, which is which is great. The song Bahar from that um, same record, Omid, from a couple of years ago, uh, ends up winning the uh, Western Australian Music Award for Song of the Year. Uh, how did that feel? Ah, oh, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was really, really cool. Aria was like, it made me feel better. But um, Wham! was really great too. So I think just both of the nominations. Also, I got nominated for the Act of the Year. I didn't win it. But um, so, yeah, it was like a good good year in terms of awards. Were you surprised that of the songs on the record, Bahar was the one that won the Song of the Year? I was. I was. Like, like out of... Because why? <laughs> it's a great song, but yeah, it's inter- it was interesting to me too. I was like, oh, this is an interesting. Let's play a little bit of Bahar. This is Tarativa. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's the uh, from the Western Australian Music Awards, that song of the year from, from the record Omid Taratiba from 2019, the song Bahar. Um, Tar- Tarjan, let me, let me go to a place that's uh, less, uh, um, maybe less positive in terms of uh, all the great reaction you've had to your music. And that is uh, something you've been dealing with for some time now which I didn't know a lot about. I, I've, it's, it's, it's caused me, I'm grateful to you to, because it's caused me to, to, to learn a little bit about chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS. Uh, this is something that you've had to deal with. Can you tell us what it means when you started feeling the symptoms and, and what, what happens to you? Well, um, first of all, the name doesn't do the justice to the illness. It's so funny because chronic fatigue syndrome, oh, you're tired. Okay. Uh, but that's not, <laughs> that's not it. Um, so in 2017, I got a virus, which is a common one, mono, you know, about the glandular fever. It's, it's very, very common. So I got this virus. I got really sick. And then apparently I never got, <laughs> you know, I never recovered. So every like, few months I had like really bad symptoms and like was so tired and like it were t- times that I was walking on the street and I was like okay just my legs are not moving I cannot like I would walk with speed of I don't know it just I could not walk or like I would just get shivers and and and, and sometimes my eyes would close and it's like well okay this is just a stress or whatever and uh, it just kept I kept getting these episodes and I kept pushing. I was touring and then I was um, uh, recording the album, the second album. So I kept pushing and I kept pushing and I just said, well, okay, I'm just going through this. That's that's okay. It's just a virus. And um, so it got worse um, to the point that um, through the end of 2019, when I released the album, I got the nomination of Arias. I got those awards. I came back to Perth and I couldn't move anymore. So I was in bed almost a year. 
it's such a strange, strange, strange illness. You cannot even listen to any podcast or read a book or or talk to any friends or watch TV or anything. Pretty much you're just lying there. You cannot even think much because you have this bad brain fog. So basically you're not living. So that was like very, very, very strange and horrible time. Well, not just strange, but it's, I mean, it sounds terrifying. It is very terrifying. And the thing is that not many doctors know about it. In fact, I was the one who found out what I have, like <laughs> through a documentary I had seen, like by chance. It's like, wow, it seems that I have, I might have this. And then I just followed up and followed up and followed up with the doctors, different doctors. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's it. What is the treatment for? Is there a treatment for CFS? Well, they always say that, oh, there's no treatment. And then these uh, charities, they just always want to raise awareness. And then uh, we need, you know, uh, you know, research and stuff to, to, to find a um, cure, to find medication. And it was so depressing because I looked into these, researchers and all these groups and then i realized the recovery rate was only five percent yeah <laughs> like, and there is this severity different severity of this illness then the my mind was like so severe that I, it's like well okay what is happening so how has it gone away or what 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 happened that you beat it Okay, so I did the diagnosis through a documentary I saw, and then I found a cure through a, 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 a Guardian uh, article. So what I found is that there are like few doctors who have been researching fatigue. What they have realized about chronic fatigue syndrome, because there were just some athletes were getting this, and um, of course they're far from don't want it to, they, they want it, like they're losing their jobs. They were like, you know, so then these doctors, they realize there should be something really physical to this. It's not like they don't want to do it. They're depressed right, or right. anything. Um, so your brain overestimates how fatigued you are and wants to protect you hmm. because fatigue is sort of, you know, it wants to protect your your body, right? It's shutting you down. It's powering you down somehow. Yeah, yeah. Because if you if you're running and you use all your resources, then that's it. You would die. Right. So the, the the brain is there to to tell the fatigue is there to tell you that you stop before you're running out of resources. You know your wow. muscles and everything. So what I started doing is that first of all I started talking to my brain, saying that okay, this is not real. Your estimation is wrong. And um, from lying down, I started sitting down for like, I don't know, two minutes. And then, you know, from two minutes and then like three minutes and then five minutes. And then I should have like remembered that like, what is my limit? So I don't pass that limit because otherwise I could relapse so badly. Yeah. So, and then again, one minute walking and then two minutes walking. And then I got to the point that I could walk for 15 minutes. And after that, I think it just got like, you know, half an hour. And then, then I got to the point that I could walk an hour and a half. And Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, a, a crazy, horrible thing to have gone through. Um, I'm so glad that that is um, over or ebbing for you. You know, you've also, I have to mention, I mean, uh, uh, in a parallel way, you've you've also been quite bravely speaking about mental illness in the last few years. Um, can you, which I, I really appreciate because I feel like in the Iranian community, it's in particular, it's something that we don't talk about. Uh, I don't know if you've received this kind of feedback from people, I assume, or I hope you have, but is as soon as you start talking about it, you realize that there's so many people, <laughs> even people that you run, you're, you're in your circle every day that you didn't know who are dealing with this and thought that they have some problem that nobody else has. Or And the more we talk about it, the more we realize that this is something that a lot of us are dealing with and in different ways, you know, and, and just knowing that is helpful. Just knowing that so many people are dealing with so much out there and that you're not some exceptional damaged person because you have anxiety or or something like that i i think is uh I, I hope you've been getting that feedback that i hope people come to you and say 
I know exactly what you're talking about because I feel that or, you know, my family does or whatever. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think, yeah, I got feedback from from people two years ago when I just went uh, on TV talking about this. It was amazing. I felt like, I felt great that like um, people feel like that. They could, you know, connect with what I've been talking about. And, um, and, and again, I want to say that Look at me, I'm not a person with a low self-esteem. I'm not a coward. You know, I have been in situations that like the most crazy situations, like I was been in the middle of someone stabbing someone else and I was, you know, there helping and all of that, blood everywhere. So You weren't helping the stabbing. You were helping the person who was stabbed, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'll tell you the story. That was actually a very interesting <laughs> story <It's> just <laughs> later. Um, so... I'm fearless, some people say, and, and and I have like a high self-esteem and all of that. But when I get to these episodes of severe anxiety, that actually when the severe anxiety is there for a long time, it, it actually leads to depression as well. So the depression is combined with anxiety. So these two always come together hand in hand. And then you feel it's so funny that you feel worthless, you feel that you cannot do anything in this world because I remember my sister was telling me, oh, okay, put this tea bag in the cup. I was crying. I could not put the tea bag in the cup. What is that? You mm. know? <laughs> so this is clearly a disorder. It's something, mm. the imbalance in, in, the, in the chemicals of my brain is happening. So it's not because I'm afraid of a tea bag in a, in a cup. So I think it just really, really, you got to talk about this. You got to really talk about this. And um, Tara, if you were to, um, I mean, we could spend a, an entire episode on this, so we can't do this really in, in, a, in a qualitative way or in a quality way in a minute. But if you were to speculate, why do you think uh, talking about, say, mental illness is so difficult, particularly for Iranians and the Iranian community. Oh, it's so stig so much stigma around it. Probably the, uh, why I can talk about this is because in the West, it's been talked about so many times that it's, it's uh, well, I'm cool with it, talk about it. But um, in Iran, I think if we do the same, you know, if we keep talking about it, if other people, if other artists or like athletes or some people who are like people know them just come join me and talk about right, this i right. think that could just um help a lot of people that leads me to and by the way i've kept you so long i thank you so much for the time that you've you've given us but this this is one of my final questions where you sort of led me to it when you were talking about uh, iran you were in iran recently in the last year or so you've been to iran what is your relationship with iran these days how how do you feel when you are there? Uh, I don't know. It's, I feel like so nostalgic this year during the Nowruz. And um, going back, you know, you feel like, oh, things are changing all the time. And um, so it's good to go and see your friends. But um, I don't know. It's, it's so difficult, Gian. It's so difficult because that's where you come from and then you see that things are changed not necessarily for the good and um yeah it's difficult i don't know what how to explain it it's yeah <laughs> what about um what's your relationship with being iranian these days i don't know i think i'm just me and, and i've been dealing with uh I don't know. I don't know the, the answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was like, what, what can I say that sounds cool here? But like, you don't have to say anything cool. It's you've been outside of the country for nine years and whether that, whether your association with, you know, whether you go back there and you go, Oh my God, this is my home. Or whether you go back and go, huh, this doesn't feel like my home anymore. My home is in Australia. You know, that's, that's what I was saying. Oh yeah. Yeah. About. Well, it's, it's, it's both. Always, always. And especially that I'm like the first generation immigrant, you know, I just like, I'm not born here and my parents didn't immigrate. And then, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not like you because 
you're British Canadian, right. basically, with a background of Iranian background, which is actually cool. You have both. But me, of course, I'm Iranian, you know, mm. like because you just build up that identity during your childhood and teenage time and your 20s. So I can I cannot say I'm well, I feel good being Australian because of the, you know the opportunities that I have and now and um can work and like you know do do what I always wanted to do but man who gets my jokes Iranians <laughs> That's it <laughs> I have so much enjoyed talking to you. I, I am such a fan of what you do, and uh, and I'm uh, thrilled to call you a friend as well as a fan, uh, be your fan. I want to go out on a little taste of a song that was also on you, this uh, most recent record, Omid, that really surprised me when this record came out because, you know, you do these kind of classic songs that you do covers of and you, and you rehabilitate or you reimagine. And then there was an Alanis Morissette song on this record, <laughs> which was kind of a shock, you know. The last thing I thought I'd ever hear in my life is a Persian version of uh, of an Alanis song. Um, but it's certainly gratifying. It's it's one of my favorite songs, actually, by her. It's called Uninvited. So tell me about the choice of putting this song on your record, and we'll we'll go out on it after we say goodbye. You know how it is when we... Um we got to listen and uh, to the music that has been released in the world because we do we, in Iran we don't have like radios who play the you know the music that is happening in the world and so those times there were just cassettes and um, you know so someone bring a cassette and everyone's copying from that cassette and like by the time it reaches you the quality is so bad <laughs> it's so funny so all all are the music that you were listening to. You know, like uh, childhood and teenage time was like, no, the CDs were coming in the teenage time, but like childhood um, mostly was uh, was the, on these cassettes. Um, but and also it, it, it was quite the same for the movies. Um, so there were these VHS ones and that everyone copies from that VHS and that was it again, like it would turn to a black and white uh, movie by the time it gets to, to you. So there was this movie, City of Angels, oh. and yeah, right, see, right. <laughs> you know, it finished, and there, there it comes this music. It's like, wow, this is so cool. I had a Walkman, and I had this cassette in it. I <laughs> recorded it from the TV, wow. and I was playing the VHS. O old school, old school. <laughs> <laughs> and then... I was listening to this song. I loved it. I loved it so much. Then, um, yeah, that's the story. And then years later, it's like, well, I just want to sing this song. Let's see what I can do with it. So, yeah, here it goes. Has Alanis heard it? Uh, her, no. Can you pass it on to her? You should send it to her. She would love it. I, I think she would think this is incredible that somebody's uh, – singing her song in us you know from australia with a in persian <laughs> i think she would get a real kick her. out of that absolutely i just try to i don't know how to send it to her but i'll try <laughs> you should you should uh taratiba um Heidi, Heidi Mochekeram, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for being so open. Thank you for uh, uh, explaining things to us and, and uh, for a really fun chat at times as well. And um, uh, I can't wait to, you know, in, in this post-COVID world to uh, to get to see each other and, and have you back out there touring so we can watch you perform. In the meantime, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gian. I really enjoyed, um, you know, the chat, and it just goes smoothly, and it's 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 really lovely. It was it was lovely. So I definitely want to come in to to Canada, and we hang. That would be cool. The uh, Canada awaits you absolutely. Um, <laughs> take care of yourself. I know it's late there in Perth. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Tara Tiba. An acclaimed Iranian-Australian vocalist and composer, her award-winning 2019 album is called Omid. Tara Tiba joined us from Perth, Australia today. Man, <laughs> 
سرم مبری و تاریک تو چشم فانوس می میره اما تو مثل خورشی قایق تو دریا از توی رویا می گذری تو تنت گرم From the 2019 album Omid, that's the song Uninvited, the Alanis Morissette song as reinterpreted by Tara T. Ba. Uh, back here with uh, Captain Reza Gurbishaya, the fabulous Keon, and Savvy Roham. Yeah. And um, how about that, Tara T. Ba? That's so cool. I thought you. I thought it was a joke when you said she has an Alanis Morissette version <laughs> Now, of that you're song. a fan of hers, but you didn't know that that Beautiful. song was on her record, Omid. I was not aware. No, yeah. I'm very ashamed to say that. But uh, my God, I, I just love her voice. I love her music. It's um, it's captivating. And I love her candor. That yeah. was a that was a, a, I I didn't 
quite know how how deep we could go into mm-hmm. those some of the subjects at the end in terms of the uh, um, her her challenges her health ch- challenges uh, mental ch- uh, health challenges but uh, I'm really grateful that she did. Yeah, I, 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 did, I didn't know. Was it chronic exhaustion? Chronic I had fatigue chron- syndrome. Chronic fatigue yeah. syndrome. I had I, that was really educational for me. I didn't know that your brain could like do something like that. Wow, Tell Debi- debilitating yeah. by the sounds of it. Yeah, your brain just shuts off. My God, power to her for you know being able to do what she does through that. Well, it sounds like she's just coming out of it, right? Yeah. This is a mm-hmm. you know. Um, and uh, I mean, I, there, there's so much there that, you know, that some of you guys, I think, who've come from Iran in the last few years, you know, or throughout your life, uh, you take for granted or you, you know about that for us, even as an Iranian guy who yeah. has friends and family and all of that uh, coming from Iran, I've always heard about Concour, mm-hmm. Concour, but I, but to hear some of the details about how this works, the system of it, it's it's so crazy to me. Like growing up in the West, the idea that there's one standardized test for an entire country that is gonna be the adjudicator of who who gets to go to yeah. post-secondary education or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I, how, how does that even accommodate somebody who just has a bad test or isn't skilled at doing that but is really talented in other areas or whatever it's insane and it's one of those things it's like a fight that since you are born your parents Mm -hmm. prep you to and they they look forward for you to take on this fight and you know and to just win it conquer it and i'm not joking like since you're like in elementary school they're like Oh, so like study, you know, and then you they're gonna take the concours. You're gonna go to good u- good university, and all you hear that because mm-hmm. it happens once a year, right? Like throughout the uh, country, it's mm-hmm. um, one day everybody takes the same test. Well, not the same test, but uh, uh, on the same day, and uh, and you know that oh, today is concours. Mm-hmm. So my cousins who are like at a certain age, like graduated high school, they're gonna take the test today, and then next year, like your other cousins or your friends. So every year, like during this time, stress level is over the roof, and it's un- it's not healthy at all. It's not. I, I I might understand the concept behind it back then, when obviously um, infrastructure, resources for education and stuff like so that. Only, was only so many spots at the university. Exactly. Yeah. So they wanted to be picky and they wanted to narrow down the options and filter out all the like get the best of the best, let mm-hmm. them in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but right now, with resources available, they and the system, like education system in the West, is not like that. Does and it's working perfectly fine. And but yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. Uh, there's there'll be crazy. people who argue it's not working per- perfectly fine here. <laughs> but oh. I- interestingly enough, I mean the the argument here is that you know post secondary education can be inaccessible based on tuition fees and mm-hmm. you know things like that. I mean it, it's light years away from one standardized test where only a few people get in, mm-hmm. yeah. and the idea that she has to. She's enamored of music, but she has mm. to like, if she wants to practice practice piano as a teenager at four in the morning, so that she can go back to studying for the concours. Yeah. It's just not something that people here have to worry about yeah. in the same yeah. way. Yeah. Well, it was the same thing. I wanted to like when I was in Iran, I wanted to go to drama school. I wanted to be an actor, mm. and uh, for the concours, I had to study like physics and and math and chemistry like what does that have to do with anything and right. you had to know and those are the um, essentially courses and mm-hmm. the the tests that are going to get you the score that you need to get into university yeah. so that you can study art which has nothing to you do know with, with everybody here uh, Shia Roham Kian let me hear more from you uh, Reza <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been talking for about 20 minutes what is this an Oprah and <laughs> well, tell all like <laughs> why do we even interview Tarati Bai just like let me start have from Reza. 1988 <laughs> when I was born he whips out his cigarette <laughs> and comes yeah. back yeah. <laughs> and then I wanted to study drama school and I oh. and people are just glazed over there's nobody left <laughs> listening yeah, uh, I, I, go ahead Shia yeah yes. I'm personally actually grateful for Concours oh. because yeah because I went to um, Ulum and Sani which means like the religious f- school no no, no. <laughs> law law, oh, he law, law. I'm literature oh. philosophy yeah, this kind and social science those yeah. kind of science I mean it's it's Concours is easier and so I got I mean I became the number one and so oh. I I f- I I got off from military service so oh. that, that that works for me 
So that's the other thing. If you get high, high score, you don't have to go to military. Yeah, the f- three first person. Really? They got wow. yeah, well, you gotta what, be a what about you, Roham? What number did you get? Well, it's competition uh, after all. <laughs> you, you can judge by uh, um, I went to the, the military. military service. So <laughs> right. yeah, I wasn't the <laughs> first. But um, uh, it's something else uh, that we didn't know about Shia. He's What's become that? the first. It's, it's like. So well, wait a second. Even you were number one in the country? Yeah. Yeah. You, wait a second. So the whole country, the whole so like not just yeah. in one field, but in the whole thing of everybody, yes. millions of people. You were number one. Yes. Yeah, so there is two main concur: one uh-huh. Sarasari, one Azad. What are those? In Sarasari, no, but in Azad, yes, I got the number. What's one. the difference? Sarasari is like a it's free. You have to. Uh, you don't have to pay for mm-hmm. Azad. Mm-hmm. You have to pay tuition. Tuition. tuition yeah. Okay. So, so how many people are involved in the same. Azad one? Same. Millions. Yeah. So you're. He I mean, got number one. Yeah. The super peace uncle know about this? <laughs> <laughs> the one who hates Shia. Maybe he does. Sure he maybe that's he why he heard Shia got number one and he was yeah, like, maybe he was my comp- competition. Competition. <laughs> yeah. That's why Shia looks like Socrates. Who He's knew? like the number one. You know. Yeah. Philosophy. You're you're a certified genius. <laughs> I'm so uh, surprised. I don't meantime, know Savvy Roham <laughs> was in a trench with a <laughs> shotgun trying to. Well, actually, the, you know. actually, I, I uh, b- before <laughs> I don't know what the military. At, is. at the night of the concours everybody is like freak out and everybody is um, studying or resting well at the uh, night of the concour I was in a party oh, so oh. there you go yeah. I, I now, never now, now, yeah. now let me ask you something that are all the people who take the concour I guess you gotta be different ages right you can't just be one age or so from 18 up you can because so, so, so there's people who've like failed it or not, not done well oh, a couple yeah. times you take it again but if you fail as a male you have to go to military service, and after you can take the concours again. again. Yes, uh-huh. torture yourself as much. So as you, you want. have to get into university. And then if the second time you don't get in, do you have to go back to the military? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it's actually. Uh, I mean, we, we joke, but it's isn't that crazy? Oh, isn't this I, just nuts. I have memories around this. Like you know, I, I used to go to Iran every two summers. And um, a few times, I remember in this, like, I don't know when they released the results, but I remember they would look in the newspapers to oh, get yeah. the results. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there were some women in the, like, distant relatives and stuff that their options were basically either they go to university or they get married. And I remember a few of them, like, you know, they kept trying and trying and they couldn't get through. <sighs> and their option was, and like know, for And, uh, for, uh, so. like, for boys, it's like uh, either going to military service or go to university. So... Wow. They wow. go to anything that they accepted in any shitty uh, yeah. place, mm-hmm. just not go, uh, not to go to the minister. Right. Right. But you have so to have a good enough cor- concourse score to get into anything. Yeah, right? but but it's it's so complicated. You can choose a um, far distant uh, city uh, and a university in that city, so y- it doesn't need that much of a good scale. Hmm. So yeah, wow. it's so complicated. Oh. God, there you go. Darius, Darius the singer. Yeah. Darius. <laughs> he has a very sad song. I mean, ten years before revolution, he has a very sad song. It's about concours. <laughs> For real? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ali Konkuri. Oh yes. wow. <laughs> Hey, a big thank you again to Kati Kavandi and Kati Kavandi Immigration Services for making this edition of Rook possible. This is a full service immigration firm that offers all inland and overseas immigration services including temporary visas permanent visas pr extensions citizenship applications katie and her team are available to inform and assist you as their client throughout the whole immigration process if you want to come to canada or you're here and you need support you need an immigration counselor katie is your person katie kavandi immigration services instagram page katie.kavandi immigration we put that on our screen there or look at it in the description of uh, whatever platform you're listening to us on or kavandi.ca Savvy Roham, thank you for uh, turning the dials and getting the music happening there with uh, Tara D- Tiba. Thank you to Tara Tiba for coming on. Thank you, uh, Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, the fabulous Keon. See you all on Monday. This is full time for Rook for today. All right. For all things Rook, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, where you can find our previous episodes, our guests, our Rook funnies, our 
videos, and you can become a patron. Support our show at pressing the, uh, by pressing the Support Us button at rockmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Pots of the artist, the fabulous Keon, Thoughtful Nadine, producer Susan, Super Patty Saw, Savvy Roham, Aray Merdad, sponsorship Sean, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizu Bashi. Mizu Bashi.